All right, well, hello, everybody. And now we're going to move into PGP 1.4, which is going to talk about intra-AS models, or how we handle IBGP within a single autonomous system. If we look at this small network, let's talk about what the problem is we're trying to solve. A to B is going to be EBGP. You can see that down here because we have two different AS numbers and we have this little dividing line. D to E is going to be EBGP. And you can see that because, of course, this is AS65001 on this side and 65102 on the other side. So this is what we have. Now, if we look at this situation, I would have IBGP between B and C, or I and IBGP between B, C and D, or the other option is what is normally done is IBGP between B and D. Why would that normally be done? Because remember, according to the IBGP rules, B advertises a route um, from B to C, or from D to C, like this 100 colon colon slice 64 route, is advertised EBGP to D, and then IBGP to C, and then C is not going to send that route to B because it was learned via IBGP. So we can't really do much other than putting an IBGP session between B and D itself. Now, in the case where something behind A, say we have a host attached here, and it wants to send a, a packet towards 100 colon colon slice 64. Say there's a server or something out here. This packet's going to traverse the EBGP link to B and then to C. But if I have an IBGP session between B and D, then there is no way for C to have these routes. So it won't know about 100 colon colon slash 64. So the packets will be dropped at C. So there's got to be some way that I can solve this problem. Well, the first most obvious way is for B and C to peer IBGP, C and D to peer IBGP, and then B and D to peer IBGP. So this is a full mesh of IBGP speakers. The reasoning here is that D will advertise the route both to B and to C. So when the traffic comes from A, it'll hit B. B will have the route with the next top over here of E. E's next top will be learned via the IGP within the autonomous system in some way. Then the B will look at the next stop and say, well, I've got to go to C to get there. C will receive it. C will have the route as learned from D, and therefore we'll send it on to D, and there we go. It carries on through the network. Now, there are problems with this. First of all, in some situations, when there is a failure, say uh, in this particular network, you wouldn't have it because I don't have two connectivity. This is not a two connected network. There are no parallel paths. But in networks with parallel paths, doing this full mesh can cause you to end up in routing loops during convergence events. So this is really, really bad. Another problem is this is really simple in a network with three routers or three BGP speakers. But if I make this a thousand net routers, trying to build the full mesh, every router needs to be fully peered with every other router using IBGP. So this is really a mess when you get to trying to configure and manage this stuff. It's not a good idea. So the second way you can do this is you can use what is called synchronization. When I was in Cisco TAC, this is what we did. We did synchronization. And this might seem absolutely insane to a lot of people when you think about what we're going to talk about doing here. What we do is we pull the routes into B through EBGP. We carry them using IBGP over to D. And then we carry them using EBGP over to E. Or so 100 colon colon slash 64 gets advertised EBGP to D, IBGP to D, B, and then EBGP to A. Awesome. What about C? What we used to do back in the bad old days was we would actually take the BGP table at D and we would redistribute it into OSPF or ISIS or EIGRP or RIP, as the case might be. So this meant that all of those routes were shoved into C's routing table. So now the packet comes from A, hits B, B knows about it because of IBGP, hits C, C knows about it because of the IGP, hits D, D knows about it because of EBGP, passes the packet on to the correct destination. Now, obviously, this is not going to work when your route count gets too high. How high is too high? Maybe 150,000 routes. Well, we're up to a million in the DFZ today, so it's not going to work. 
So this is one option, however, that was used for a long time. In fact, on many early implementations of BGP, you had to turn synchronization off because it was on by default, because uh, so many people filed defects in open cases, because what they were doing was they were trying this without synchronization, and all the traffic would drop in the middle of their AS. Another option that we had back in the bad old days where we had what were called confederations or just confeds. So what we would do in a confederation is we would put all three of these routers in a single confederation and we would call that confed 65101. Okay, that's what we would do. Now this router could actually be placed in a separate AS and it would be called AS, say, 65200. And then this one would be in a, say, 65200. Uh, 201 and say this one is in 65202. Okay, so what happens here is that the route is advertised, or I'm sorry, let's go from the other direction, 100 colon colon slash 64. The route is advertised, it picks up A65102, uh, so 65102 in the AS path. When it hits this D router, it hits this D router and it's going to pick up a sub AS path. It's going to pick up a secondary AS path. And this AS path is going to be added um, when it's advertised from D to C. You're going to see the AS path has 2, 203 or 203. And then when I advertise it from C to B, I'm going to see 2. Um, so it's going to be 102, 202 comma 203 or whatever it is. It would actually be something like this. It would actually be 203, 202 or whatever it is here. And so then what advertises out, however, the BGP speaker at B recognizes that these 200 number um, AS 65201, 202, 203 are internal to the AS, internal to the configuration. So now what it's going to do is it's going to strip this section off and advertise it as if the route originates from AS 65102, and then it's going to add 65101. So the AS path over here at A is 65102, 65101, and that's going to be the AS path over here. So that is how a confed works. So a confederation is basically allows you to create a group of AS's that appear from the outside to be a single AS. It gives you all of your EBGP tools within the autonomous system or within the confederation. So this AS confederation concept was not just used to solve the router in the middle problem. There was another thing that this did was, is it allowed us to merge. So there were a lot of purchases. So one AS would buy another one, another AS, or provider would buy another provider, and they would want to merge their ASs. Well, confeds gave you a way to solve that problem. There are other solutions for that problem we'll talk about later, but that's one thing they were used for. Now, if we think about it, the problem we're trying to solve here is that we have this router in the middle, and we can't carry routes IBGP from, say, D to C and C to B. Why not? because we don't have any way in the IBGP format to make sure that the path is loop-free within the autonomous system. What we need is some way to do that. So what we do in the synchronization case is we just carry the routes through the IGP, and we allow the IGP to provide us loop-freeness through the autonomous system itself. In the case of confederations, we create a secondary section of the AS path. It's actually part of the main AS path, but then we know part of that is kind of fake, and we pull that fake part off as we come out of the AS. What instead if we could create a mini autonomous system path or a mini AS path inside my autonomous system? What if I had some sort of a secondary list of routers or something within the autonomous system that allow me to make sure that the the packet is not looping or the path is not a loop through the autonomous system? This is precisely what route reflectors do. So if I look at C, and I make C into a route reflector, now C has a router ID, a RID. Now this RID can double as something called a cluster ID. So what I do in route reflectors is I can build what I call clusters. So a cluster is simply a route reflector with its clients. So as a route is advertised through eBGP up through IBGP, when the route gets to the route reflector. The route reflector adds a cluster list and adds its cluster ID onto it. 
This effectively creates a mini AS path within the autonomous system, but it's an AS path of cluster IDs or router IDs of all the route reflectors through which this route has been advertised within the AS. So this allows me to have this loop freeness. So what I can do is, is if I make C into a route reflector, and then I make B and D RRCs or route reflector clients, then what happens is E advertises 100 colon colon slash 64 to D. This means it has an AS path of 65102. When D picks it up, it doesn't even know it's a route reflector client. It just has an IBGP session to C. When it sends that route to C, because it's an EBGP route, so it can send it to an IBGP peer, C looks at it and says, I'm receiving this from one of my route reflector clients. So what I can do is I can add a cluster list as an attribute onto the NLRI, and then I can add my router ID as a cluster ID, and then I can re-advertise it to anybody else who's in my cluster. Now, if I advertise it to B and B decides to advertise it back to me, what happens at C is, is I look at the cluster list just like I do the AS path, and I say, well, I'm already in the cluster list, so therefore I can toss that. I don't need to deal with this. So this is how route reflectors essentially work. They just create a mini AS path within the autonomous system almost. Now the rules about it are very, very similar to EBGP. Don't get really confused about the route reflection rules. If, if you're reflecting to a route reflector client of yours as a route reflector, then you treat it like EBGP because you're injecting the cluster list. So you still have your loop freeness properties. Now, if you're advertising to someone who's outside of your route reflector client list, you treat them just as if you would a standard IBGP peer, which means you don't re-advertise anything that you've learned from another IBGP peer. Now, there's this interesting problem with route reflectors, which is that the route reflector itself doesn't always choose the optimal path. So let's make D in this network a route reflector. And let's make C a route reflector client, and B a route reflector client, and E a route reflector client. Now in this situation, we're gonna play a little trick to make this break correctly so you see what the problem is. From A, I am advertising this 100 colon colon slash 64 route. It is being advertised to B and to C. Now for whatever reason, the network administrator has set B and C to next top self. So therefore, when B and C advertise the route up to D, the route reflector receives two routes, one with the next top of C, one with the next top of B. All right, so now what is the route reflector going to do? The route reflector is gonna run best path and it's gonna see the path to B is one, the path through C is two, it's gonna choose the path to B, and it's gonna reflect that path down to E. Now the next top that on the path towards 100 colon colon slash 64 that E receives is via B because we run next top self here. So this causes a problem. This means that E's path to 100 colon colon slash 64 is suboptimal. How can I fix this? Well, there are a couple of ways I can do this. The first is at D, I can calculate the best path from each of my client's perspectives. So I can calculate the best path from E's perspective instead of my own perspective. And once I do that, I know which path to send to E because E has this other path to C right here, and I can see that in my SPF or whatever. So I know that I have a better path from E's perspective. So that's one way you can solve it. And that's described in a couple of drafts. I don't know that it's ever been implemented any place. The other option is D can say, well, I have two paths. I'm just gonna send them both to E and let make E make its own decision locally. So this is called multipath. And this is originally what multipath was set up for, was to solve this specific problem. So multipath allows the route reflector or a BGP speaker to send multiple paths to a given destination. You'll find this in data center networks and other places with eBGP being used today. Now, what does multipath break? That's what you always have to ask. If you haven't found the trade-offs, you haven't looked hard enough. So what is the trade-off with multipath? The trade-off is, is it destroys implicit withdrawals. Okay, how does it do that? Let's say that normally there are two routes advertised up and I'm using BGP multipath down to E. When E receives the first route, say via B, it's gonna receive that route and assume that's the correct route. 
Then when it receives another route via C, it's going to assume that this is an implicit withdrawal of the B route, right? Because it's a second route for the same destination. So it must be an implicit withdrawal, but that's not your effect that you want. So when you turn on multipath, you have to turn off implicit withdrawals and make all of your withdrawals explicit. So this can increase the traffic on the network a little bit, but the trade-off generally in these types of situations is well worth it. Well, that's it for this intro kind of section of BGP. Uh, we'll be talking more about BGP in future lessons. Thanks.